So sometimes I want to talk about one subject, but that subject gets displaced by something that I think is more important. Today is one example of that. I was uh, I, I spent a lot of time on RT on the website, uh, watching their videos, trying to understand what they're saying, and uh, so we're going to watch crosstalk. If you're not familiar with crosstalk, it's a English speaking um, RT. Um, talk show where they talk about how Russia's awesome and Ukraine is going to fall apart and that kind of thing. It's not always about Ukraine, but um, during the war, it's been quite a bit uh, about Ukraine. And he's going to have some experts on who will be you know, you know, essentially repeating Russian talking points. Now, the reason that this is important, yesterday I was talking about how to talk to a friend who is repeating Russian talking points. These are the kind of Russian talking points you're going to hear. So you, you're going to want to watch this with an eye to the kinds of things that will be mimicked, particularly by Americans who are um, repeating these talking points. Okay, so here we go. We're going to watch this now. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The architects of NATO's proxy war on Russia have big plans for the Kiev regime. As Ukraine's counteroffensive fails, the country's post-war realities are being planned in the West. Allow okay, notice how as the counteroffensive fails, I, I mean, I talked about that again and again and again just recently. They, they always are talking about the, this as a talking point. It's, it's an assumption upon which everything else is directed and that's how they're going to frame this yes, these plans will fail too Cross-talking Ukraine's fate, I'm joined by my guest Aaron Good in Philadelphia. He's a political scientist, historian, as well as author of American Exception, Empire. He's a professor at Temple University. He's a legitimate professor. He's just on the Russian talking point side. And the deep state in Raleigh, we have Ray McGovern. He is a former CIA analyst. And in Lisbon, we he's a he's a former CIA analyst. But let's look at this. Let's go to RT dot com rt loves this guy ray mcgovern and he comes up and search 210 times he's the kind of guy that they really like because he says the kind of things that they really like to hear and in lisbon we cross to natalie morris she is host of the redacted podcast All and right. you've seen me do um reactions to redacted and she is just she and clayton morris are just uh, awful in the way that they approach things but let's let's go on and see what they have to say we're, we're only going to do the first 10 minutes or so because that's all that I feel is okay to inflict upon you. So in effect, that means you can jump anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Ray, let me go to you first. Um, we all know it's, it's seeped into regime media in the, in the West that the counteroffensive... Okay, regime media. This is mainstream media called regime, as in Ukrainian regime media, okay? Uh, and as you're watching this, just, just keep an eye out for assumptions made with the, the assertions that are made that are Russian repeating points, right? They're not going to try to prove that this happened. They're going to say 400,000 Ukrainians have died. Where do you get that fact? Well, RT said it somewhere. So it's that kind of thing is not going well. We also know from the Wall Street Journal, again, regime media, that it was never thought to the Wall Street Journal is regime media. Like, remember, there's, you can't, like, who, who can you listen to that, that's not regime media? It would, be, it would work out very well anyway. Um, and, but they let it go forward. They're talking about the counteroffensive. The counteroffensive was going to fail, but they let it go forward. Well, the Ukrainians are really in a bind. They don't have the right weapons that they need or that the U.S. would prosecute a war with, for example, but they need to get this done on a deadline because they need to prove something. So they have a tough road, and, I, and I've talked about that, but okay, let's hear what he has to say. But at the same time, I, I hear these State Department and Pentagon officials talking about post-war realities. I mean, I don't know how we get from a failed counteroffensive to talking about post-war realities. Can you uh, connect that dot for me? Go ahead, Ray. Okay. And so here's another interesting thing to listen for, because they're saying, you know, the West is saying Russia has already lost. Russia is also saying Ukraine has already lost. They can't possibly win. So both are saying the same thing. Okay. I've belabored it long enough. Hey. 
Yes, Peter. They're finally trying to act like the Vestal virgins in the Gospel of Matthew. Remember those uh, virgins, uh, some of them brought extra oil and extra shells for their 155 millimeter howitzers. Uh, they got to go to the wedding. The ones that ran out of ammunition didn't. In other words, there's been no real planning for what happened here. Uh, the Ukrainians are out of ammunition, and yet the president of the United States and his lieutenants. Okay, let's talk about out of ammunition. Um, the, this is a, a constant talking point. They, the Ukrainians are out of ammunition. Actually, Ukrainians are creating their own ammunition now, and they're not going to run out of ammunition. They might have to displace certain systems over time. But the idea that the collective West cannot supply one country with enough ammunition to be able to defend itself and while that country is trying to build its own ammunition um, against Russia, because Russia is apparently a bottomless pit of ammunition, I, I just can't see that. Um, yes, they have to be careful with what they are using, which stocks and which supplies, because they're going to have to potentially switch from one system to another or whatever. But OK. Keep saying Russia has already lost the war. Yeah. Bottom yeah. line here. Bottom line, the president is delusional. Uh, he was speaking in, in Maine uh, last Friday, and he said, you know, who can save the world? Who can, bring the pre who can bring the whole world together? Not me, but the president of the United States can. Only he can. And then he cited Madeleine Albright, for God's sake, saying, you know, we are exceptional, we're indispensable, and you know, Aaron has written a whole book about how exceptional we are. It's going to all fall very flat. Meanwhile, I have to compliment Mr. Putin on being very cautious and very gradual. Of course he has to compliment Putin because Putin is so dreamy. And you're with a delusionary president. One doesn't want to put his back against the wall earlier. Now, when this is the same Vladimir Putin who thought that this was going to be essentially mopped up in three days and then in three weeks to have the whole country because he had bad intel because he's in a system where he can't really get accurate information in his authoritarian regime. And he's complimenting Putin for being so thoughtful about everything moving forward. That's where this guy is. Oh, by the way, he's a former CIA analyst, and they'll flash that on the screen regularly with him because they do the same thing with Ritter, former UN inspector or whatever. It has to. Yep. Natalie, in, in Lisbon, uh, uh, well, uh, Ray has already mentioned it, so I'm going to uh, pull it forward. Um, we had uh, uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State and the President of the United States, saying that Russia is losing or has lost. So, Natalie... Do they are they implying that Ukraine is won? I mean, it, it is kind of a bind. Again, they're saying that Russia is losing or is lost. Russia is saying Ukraine is losing or is lost. I'm not. Uh, by, by the way, listen for this as well. Not just listen for the Russian talking points that are going forward. That you know Americans may watch this and repeat. Listen for the opposite effect, like the mirroring effect. What like they're saying. The, about the U.S., what they're doing, or right? I mean, it's just it, it's this weird, almost Freudian projection kind of thing going on. Binary win lose. Go ahead. Natalie. Yes, and we saw that when CNN talked to President Trump recently, a few months ago, when they said, "Who do you want to win or lose?" As if it is a binary, as if there's just no nuance in it. He said, "I want the dying to stop," uh, indicating that there is sort of an option for peace if we all understood the nuance the problem if we all understood the nuance there's an option for peace russia wants this peace right now while they get to hang on to these territories russia will say um the new reality is that we, we can have peace we're open to peace but you have to accept the new realities that's not open to peace that's no more open to peace than ukraine is open to peace um uh, uh, right now so let's not like lie to ourselves about well we, we really just want peace and they just don't want it it's not like that um, is that the west sort of feels like all of ukraine is being just bombed to oblivion by russia 
you know, to their chagrin that they have no way to stop this. They don't understand the offerings of peace talks. They don't understand that the war has no. been concentrated in the Donbass for all. They, they understand the offering of peace talks. The, the trick is that if you do allow these peace talks, you just allow Russia time to go back and retool and do it again. So they don't want that because that's not real peace almost 10 years now, this lack of nuance enables them to continue to sell the war and enables them to sell the idea that if we don't stop Putin, he's just going to keep on going all the way to where I am, Lisbon, which is the Western. To sell the war. I think Putin did that pretty well when he invaded. Most part of Europe that, you know, all of a sudden this will be Russia if we don't stop uh, this regime of Putin. And this Lack of nuance, this lack of studying, this inability to rewind the tape is what allows them to sell the war to Americans so that they just, you know, they accept it. They accept yeah, what the State they, Department they, says. They, they accept they, what the president says. They sell it irrespective of the reality. Did you hear the word sell about five times there? Sell, 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 sell. Realities on the ground. That's what we're trying to Absolutely. get at here. Absolutely. But I think what's important is just today uh, or just recently on military.com, there was an open call for a draft inside the United States. And I think that that's important because the previous wars in the Middle East really didn't cost the middle or upper classes very much. It was farmed from the poorest among right. amongst us. So we didn't have to feel it. If you were an educated upper middle class person, it's just like, oh, that's too bad, right? But if there is an opportunity for a draft, if it costs actual American lives, we might feel quite differently. I have a teenage son now. I absolutely don't feel like any of the wars that the United States has been involved in in the last 40 years are something that I would want to sacrifice my son or anybody else's son. And it's different when it, will, it involves your husband, your nephew, your yeah, brother, your but, son. But it, it, what is interesting, Aaron, is that we have U.S. Congressman uh, Lindsey Graham, for example, wanting the Ukrainians to give up their sons uh, at a whim um, uh, yes. for, for, for ideology. Aaron, I mean, you know, it, this is what, what okay, makes I it really... I want to pause this because she said this was on military.com, a draft. Uh, I was just Googling it. Um, and I looked it up earlier because I watched this before I, I decided I was going to do this. And I Googled draft on Google and there was nothing. It was all about the NFL draft. I went to military.com. I didn't see it. The thing I saw about the draft was 2010. Um, but there's not really talk about the draft. But the the Russian side of this equation talks about, well, I don't want World War III. I don't want the draft to come back. I don't want nuclear bombs. They're the ones always raising these prospects. And they raise these prospects for a reason. It's to deter the West. Okay, so let's keep going. Whimsical because the U.S. in many ways, because it can print money into oblivion, the, 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 the chickens will come home to roost eventually on that. But you, they can print all the money they want. And they can buy all this uh, extremely expensive hardware and send it to Ukraine, but they don't lose forces. And that is part of what, part of the cynicism of this war, Aaron. But that's not that's not cynicism. That's arming people who need help. I, I don't understand how that's cynicism. I don't think the Ukrainians are thinking, you know, those Americans are cynical in arming us. They're not. They're, they're grateful to have the weapons. Yeah, absolutely. The Ukrainian losses are pretty staggering. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 400, 000, over 400,000 by many accounts, which is, that's how much the- U Over 400,000 Ukrainian losses. That is something that Russian state media talks about. And they talk about how their losses are about, only a tenth of what the Ukrainian losses are, which is nonsense. U.S. lost fighting World War II, uh, if you add up both theaters, pretty much. So this is, and this is a much smaller country, and the idea that they're going to somehow turn this around is preposterous at this point, uh, and yet they're saying this. You do, it does raise the question, is Biden senile, uh, or is he being misled, or is he, is he you know, just delusional in some other way, or are they... I'll reverse that. Is Putin being misled, or senile, or... <laughs> right? I mean, you could... You could just as easily apply that to the other side. And I think yeah, maybe there's some truth there. They just trying to somehow limp along and say we're winning, you know, everything's going great. 
and hope that they can uh, do that until the election? Or, I mean, it, it, it's becomes strange because you at some point they have to be aware that reality is going to uh is going to come into play and, and be brought to bear on the perceptions of people and uh it, it just reminds me of carl rove uh at that statement he made to ron suskin it's always attributed to carl rove like we're an empire now and we make our own reality and we're seeing the end of uh, that cycle um which really began at the end of with the end of world war ii the dropping of the nuclear bombs which was totally gratuitous uh, and the, the way that the U.S. has just ex explained the way that it wanted the world to be understood by people and pretty much enforced that as much as it could. And uh, but the more, you know, the more the empire kind of becomes overextended and fraying, the more that the narrative just stops conforming to reality. Yeah, but and it, we're in that. And listen to everything in light of applying the same thing to Russia. And just and then you, then you see the way that things actually are. It's, it's absolutely fascinating to listen to stage now where nothing makes any sense it doesn't make any sense because and, and aaron's right but, uh, ray but the one of the th problems that I, the asymmetrical uh, element of all this is that uh, russia has couched this all in its security concerns the west ignores them but russia will enforce them but the, the u.s primarily in its in, in nato world they're fighting an ideological war okay and so that last point was one of the few things that i think was actually legitimate in this whole conversation R russia is very concerned about ukraine becoming part of nato but they went about this all the wrong way instead of wooing them back they decided that they're going to say you're going to love me or else or i'm going to come and beat you right i mean that's not the way to go about doing this and when the russia talks about nato encroaching eastward it's not that at all it is that these countries that were former soviet or former warsaw pact have fled to the arms of the west because they're scared of what you might do to them russia that's what's happened and they don't see that at all let's keep going for hegemony and not about security and that is why it's so asymmetrical ray well for russia as you say peter uh, it's an existential threat Wait a minute, I thought there was nothing to see here. It's just a special military operation, and we are not even supposed to call it a war, but now it has become this existential threat. It's an existential threat to Ukraine, and because you've invaded with 200,000, and then you added another 300,000, allegedly, to that, including your conscripts and Wagner and whatever else. And so, yeah, anyway... And uh, just look at what Medvedev, the former president, said just a oh, few gosh. days He's ago Medyev. about being required to use nuclear weapons in the unlikely chance. Yeah, and, and Medvedev says this kind of thing about nuclear weapons. I mean, what time you can set your watch by it, like almost daily, at least weekly, he'll say something saber rattling like that. NATO starts to prevail. So, is it an existential threat to NATO or to the United States? And he well, says that to deter the West. And there's a reason why he's talking about nuclear, the specter of nuclear weapons, because then that'll get picked up by these people who will then pick it up. Uh, uh, Americans and other Westerners who kind of lean toward Russia will pick up what these guys are saying. And here we go. Not in realpolitik terms, but in ideological, if you will, hegemonistic terms. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, so but, but, one, Ray, but Ray, they made it right. that way. America is the hegemon, not Russia, who's actually invading their neighbor and trying to take it over. Like, yeah. They framed it that way as some kind of moral crusade. And, they, it, and, and that's what makes it even more dangerous because these people, look at Victoria Newland got a promotion for goodness sake, okay? These are ideologues and you cannot negotiate. Listen, he's saying these are ideologues and you cannot negotiate with ideologues. Look who's talking. Negotiate with ideologues, Ray. They're also delusional, okay? They're not going to win. They're going to have to face up to it, uh, the possibility that Russia will win definitively. Russia has enough troops in place to do that. So what will Biden They don't have enough troops in place, and that's why they're raising it. But see, here, here there's a grain of truth. Russia is 
is not planning on going anywhere and they're planning on raising the troops. They don't have enough right now, but they've just extended the military contracts. They made it like on your phone where you can have to um, get your, your conscript, your conscription call on your phone. And then you have to report they're, they're, they're uh, reaching down to 10th grade to start teaching basic military tactics. Um, and so they're not planning on going anywhere. So he's right about that point, but they don't have it right now. Biden do. Uh, that's really the question. They're out of ammunition, normal ammunition. They're, they soon will be out of this cluster of ammunition. Will these neophytes say, well, on that top shelf there, the one that has the lock on it, those are the mini nukes. Will they do that? I would not put, put it past them. I, okay. I, I promised you not more than 10 minutes so that you could get a taste and an understanding of what this is. We just passed the 10 minute mark. No, they're not going to start giving them nukes. Uh, they will make sure that they have weapons, but it might not be the ideal weapons. And that's part of the problem that they're having with the counteroffensive. Okay. This is a taste so that you can understand what is being communicated uh, in English language to people who are, the, the wool is over the eyes of those that are supporting Russia and say, and repeating these kind of talking points. And if, if you've been in conversations with these people, these are things that you're familiar with already. Okay. I wanted to share that with you so that you understand what you're up against. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, and, and tell me what, what your impression was of this, of like what, what stuck out to you. I'd love to hear that in the comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes. If you like this, it'll go farther. If you share, it'll go even farther. If you subscribe, you'll see more videos tomorrow. I'll be back again. And thank you for the coffees. Thank you more than anything else for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.